Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in-game as well. Now throughout D&D's history there have been so many creatures, even in this 5th edition there are hundreds and hundreds of creatures to choose from for topics for this video, so instead of me just going by my flight of fancy, I like to hear what you would actually like to see. So I use your suggestions, which means if while you're watching this, a creature suddenly strikes you as something that you'd really like to see my interpretation of as an artist, or you'd like to hear the mythology and lore of, then make sure to leave that creature down below in the comments section so I can add it to my to draw list. The most popular members of that to draw list, those who come up most frequently in the comments, I hand over to my patrons over on Patreon, who every single month get a chance to vote on which ones of your suggestions they'd like to see in what order. So if you'd like a bit more control over the types of videos that you see from me, and like them you'd like to help me make these videos for you every single week, and support the channel in a very very personal way, then I'll make sure to leave a link to my Patreon page down below in the description box. So thank you very much if you choose to do that. But regardless, today's video of Phoenixes, a topic that I've been very very eager to cover, was first suggested by Thunderbird the Great, down in the comment section. So thank you so much for your wonderful suggestion, Thunderbird. Without any further ado, I believe it's time to get started discussing the lore of these fantastic, fantastic creatures. I believe the Phoenix first appeared in Dungeons and Dragons through the Monster Manual 2 for first edition, released in 1983. But the real world mythological counterpart has origins that are so ancient that they're practically lost to time. In fact, the word Phoenix is believed to have been adapted from the Mycenaean Greek word ponike, which either meant griffin, strangely enough, or perhaps the word palm tree, no one's completely sure. Palm trees seem like a strange origin for this creature, but the ancient Egyptians, where the concept of the phoenix is very likely to have originated, palm trees are used, or were used, for almost everything. Most poignantly, perhaps, they're the ingredient primarily used to start fires. But although there was a great deal of symbolism surrounding the palm tree, we know that palm branches were awarded to athletes in ancient Greece, and they were associated with symbols of Nike, the god of victory in ancient Rome. But to the ancient Egyptians, palm branches were a symbol not only of victory and triumph, but of peace and eternal life, something very highly connected to the phoenix. I was perhaps naive in not realising that palm trees are where sweet dates come from something very much associated with the people of Egypt. And so, if something provides so much for so many people, including the ability to create fires, and also something whose seasonal produce feed people, it's easy to see that there may be a connection with renewal, seasonality, and life. It's generally believed that the phoenix does owe its origins to the ancient Egyptians. One of the earliest concrete writings about the phoenix comes from Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BCE, who says, and I quote, The Egyptians have also another sacred bird called the phoenix, which I myself have never seen except in pictures. Indeed, it is a great rarity even in Egypt, only coming there, according to the accounts of the people of Heliopolis, one in 500 years, when the old phoenix dies. Its size and appearance, if it is like the pictures, are as follows. The plumage is partly red, partly golden, while the general make and size are almost exactly that of an eagle, they tell a story of what the bird does, which does not seem to me to be credible, that he comes all the way from Arabia and brings the parent bird, all plastered over with myrrh, to the temple of the sun, and there buries the body. In order to bring him, they say, he first forms a ball of myrrh, as big as he finds that he can carry. Then he hollows out the ball and puts his parent inside, after which he covers over the opening with fresh myrrh, and the ball is then of exactly the same weight as the first. So he brings it to Egypt, plastered over, as I have said, and deposits it in the Temple of the Sun. Such is the story they tell of the doings of this bird. Although it's likely that the word phoenix is a Greek interpretation of Egyptians talking about Bennu, another bird deity tied to the sun, creation, and the concept of rebirth. So, phoenixes appear in numerous legends and myths since those early days in human history, but generally they seem to be highly connected to fire, and most legends in some way feature the fact that when they die, they are turned to ash in some beautiful flame, and a new ember of life is born from within, at which point 
they may rise again from their own ashes, an eternally living creature. As a result, when they appeared in 5th edition's Morden Cadence Tome of Foes, they were depicted as beautiful birds constructed almost entirely of fire and considered ancient and gargantuan elementals native to the plane of fire. Throughout the various editions of D&D, phoenixes have changed their appearance quite drastically, originally appearing somewhat like a stork or a crane, becoming something more vulture-like in 2nd edition, and then in 3rd and onwards they appear far more like perhaps an eagle in some way, tying them back maybe to their griffin heritage, or maybe simply emulating eagles and their regal appearance. Historically, however, there is no sort of one set appearance for the phoenix, as they seem to have appeared as a variety of different birds or inspired by different parts of various birds. Bennu, for example, the original inspiration for the phoenix, according to ancient Egypt, was based on a heron, for example. But just as regularly, the phoenix in medieval art is pictured with halos, tying them in some way to the sun and divinity. And this led many artists to illustrate them as cockerels due to their cyclical lifestyles and their connection with the rising sun. Usually when a phoenix is depicted with a halo, it has seven rays shining from it, which is a reference to Helios, the Greek personification of the sun, who also is always depicted with seven shining rays. I feel like the number seven may play some sort of role in this illustration, just to tie back to that original theme. Maybe it should have seven long tail feathers, seven eyes, or a crown with seven spikes, something like that. At the time of recording this, I've not actually drawn my illustration for this creature, because I like my research to sort of inspire how the drawing goes, but hopefully the number seven will play quite a big role in this creature. I'm sure my interpretation of the phoenix will likely be inspired by the games that I've played and the western influences that I've had, just like D&D where these creatures are wreathed or perhaps constructed entirely of flame. But there are also other really fascinating inspirations that I'd like to draw on if I can. Publius Cornelius Tacitus, a Roman politician and historian writing the first century CE, describes the phoenix more like a peacock whose colour is made to stand out from all other birds. Far from the reds and oranges that I'm used to in Western media, Publius's phoenix often had green or purple, maybe even blue hues to their feathers, and earlier accounts indicate that the phoenix had red legs and striking yellow eyes, whereas contrary accounts, like those of Lucius Caecilius Ferminatus Lactanitus, a Christian author writing sometime between 250 and 300 CE, claim that the phoenix's eyes were blue, like sapphires, and that its legs were covered in yellow gold scales with rose-coloured talons. So luckily for me, as an artist who likes to put their own spin on things, there doesn't seem to be a concrete description of one of these creatures, which means artistically, I have a pretty open license to draw whatever I think is appropriate, which you know I always love. But I should probably talk about what this creature is actually like in-game. Well, in 5th edition's Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes, where this creature reaches us in this edition, we're told that this Elder Elemental, which is gargantuan, has an armor class of 18 and 10d20 plus 70 hit points. It can fly at 120 feet, but can walk at 20 feet as well. I don't definitely know which one I would choose. Being almost entirely constructed out of fire, it's resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks, and is obviously immune to fire and poison where it really won't get very far with something without, you know, blood in its veins. It's immune to exhaustion, being grappled. God, why would someone grapple something made out of fire? It's immune to being paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, being knocked prone as a giant bird, restrained, again, why would you touch it, and stunned. It apparently has 60 foot dark vision, which I find strikingly strange because I don't imagine anything within the vicinity of a phoenix is going to be in any way dark, but there we go. And it is a legendary creature, which means, just like all other legendary creatures, it gets legendary resistance three times a day, which means that if it fails a saving throw it can choose instead to succeed three times, and it also gets legendary actions, using one of its three legendary actions at the end of another creature's turn, regaining all of these spent actions at the start of its own turn. It can make a peck attack with its beak, which deals 2d6 plus 8 fire damage, and setting things and creatures alight, causing them 1d10 fire damage at the start of every single one of its turns, unless doused in some capacity. It can move up to its movement speed, or at the cost of two actions, it can use a swoop legendary action, causing the phoenix to move up to its speed, and do a talon attack 
which deals 2d8 plus 8 fire damage. Being absolutely enormous, this creature counts as a siege monster, dealing double damage to objects and structures, which means things are pretty much instantly burnt to a crisp because of a rule that the phoenix has called fire form, which says that the phoenix can move through a space as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing because it's literally made out of fire and therefore I guess operates just as some sort of heat energy. It doesn't really need to worry about small spaces slowing it down although I imagine it just crashes through objects as well. Any creature that touches the phoenix, or hits it with a melee attack, while it's within 5 feet of it, takes 1d10 fire damage. That's just it, you don't make a save or anything like that, you just take that damage. In addition, the phoenix can enter a hostile creature's space and just stop there, causing that creature to take 1d10 fire damage, and with a single touch, the phoenix can also ignite flammable objects that aren't being worn or carried with no action required. So, attached to its siege monster-like status if there is, in fact, a wooden or at least remotely flammable based town that this creature seems to be in, it's going to be set on fire and take double that damage, so it's going to be burnt to ash very, very quickly. In terms of its own actions, it gets to make two attacks per turn as a multi-attack, and one of the most useful things that this creature has is a rule called flyby, which some other D&D creatures have, but it's particularly useful for flying creatures like this meaning that the phoenix does not provoke opportunity attacks when it flies out of the enemy reach. And with that 120 foot flying speed, and any time it just lands in another creature's space, they start to burn for 1d10 damage, this creature can just fly around in circles, scorching the entire party to death before it even takes a main action to attack. Now we all know that phoenixes, when they die, turn to ash, and that from the ashes they rise once again, renewed. And there is a rule to that effect in D&D called Fiery Death and Rebirth, which says that when a phoenix dies, it explodes. Not quite the ashes we were expecting. Each creature within 60 feet of it must take a dexterity saving throw, which I'm not going to tell you for spoiler reasons, but it's very, very high. And if they fail, they take 40 10 fire damage, or half as much on a successful one. The fire obviously ignites flammable objects nearby, and the explosion destroys the phoenix's body and leaves behind an egg-shaped cinder that weighs five pounds. The cinder is blazing hot, dealing 66 fire damage to any creature that touches it, though no more than once per round. And the cinder is immune to all damage, and after 1d6 days, it hatches into a new phoenix. Not a tiny little baby phoenix, but it just says a phoenix. So this creature is utterly immortal, and I really love that. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. I absolutely loved researching this one. I love creatures that are actually in real world mythologies and legends and that find their way into D&D because there's so much influence to draw from, so many ideas to pick apart and so many concepts to add to this creature to really make it my own. So thank you so much for joining me for today's video. If you enjoyed it too, I hope you'll leave a little like down below, perhaps favorite this video and share it with your D&D party because all of those things really, really help this channel to grow and tell YouTube if I'm doing a good job or not. If you'd like to see more videos than, from me, I hope you'll subscribe to the channel because again, that is a very clear signal as a win in the YouTube book. It makes YouTube and me very, very happy. So I hope you'll join our community. And speaking of communities, I have a Patreon page. So if you'd like to support the channel in a very personal way and help me make these videos every single week, I hope you'll head over to Patreon, but it's not a purely selfish endeavour, don't worry. I do give all of my patrons lovely rewards, including things like one-on-one -on -one chats, the ability to vote on every single one of these videos coming out, and in what order they appear, and also copies of all of these illustrations. So if you particularly loved this drawing and you'd like a copy for yourself, I'll make sure to leave the link to my Patreon down below in my description section. But anyway, until next time, I hope you won't pick up the little egg-like cinder that the vendor is trying to sell you while his stool burns to the ground because in 1d6 days it's going to turn into a very, very wild and potentially quite irked phoenix. So make sure to bring lots of buckets of water if you do accidentally happen to buy one of these things. And until next time, happy monster hunting.